So hello to everyone. We are here for a new EasyChem chat. I had a great pleasure today to welcome Marlis Osterman from London, from the Gaze St. Thomas Hospital in London. Hi, Marlis. Hello, Fabio uh, and colleagues. Nice to see you, Marlis. Um, we had the chance to have you today as an expert also in, of course, kidney dysfunction and critical ill patients. And I would like to make you some questions about the renal replacement therapy. And my first question for you is maybe a classical one, intermittent or continuous? Which one do you like, do you prefer, do you use, or is at the end both? Uh, thank you, Fabio. That's such an important question. Can I just start uh, by talking about renal replacement, the term renal replacement therapy? And I know we use it in the literature in clinical practice, but the machines which we use in critical care to, um, for patients with acute kidney injury are not really machines to replace kidney function. So they, in reality, can only remove waste products and fluid, but they do not replace kidney function. So they're not really devices to replace the renal function because the kidneys do much, much more. They, they are endocrine organs, metabolic organs. They are involved in blood pressure control. So uh, the question then is, when using these machines to help a failing kidney, would it be better to use a machine intermittently or continuously? And again, this question has um, occupied clinicians and researchers for more than 20 years. To start with, both are accepted forms to support kidneys when they're struggling. And both have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, with a continuous device, fluid is removed continuously and uh, the metabolic base products are removed continuously. Acid base is controlled continuously, but it means the patient is exposed to anticoagulation to the circuit all the time for 24 hours and the patient is usually confined to their bed. With the intermittent modality, the same happens. So fluids and waste products are removed, but they have to be removed over in a much shorter period, so mm -hmm. much more aggressively. Fluid has to be removed faster to get the same effect. Uh, and that has potential disadvantages. And for instance, if fluid gets removed too fast, the patient may drop the blood pressure. But the clear advantage is there is more time for the patient to do other things to, for instance, engage in physiotherapy or rehabilitation or leave the intensive care unit. So both are accepted established therapies uh, with advantages and disadvantages. And the, 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 the art in medicine is to choose the right form for the individual patient in front of you. In clinical trials where they got compared, uh, they've not been shown to be superior. Yes. Uh, but I would like to say that in the clinical trials, people have used the same modality from the beginning to the end. Uh, so patients randomized to intermittent would receive intermittent all the time and the same with continuous. And maybe that's a, a limitation of the trials that patients in clinical trials did not receive what we would advocate, i.e. receiving the modality that suits the patient best. You, you may say, for example, a patient with a severe metabolic compromise might go for continuous, and then when it is stable, you can go for uh, an intermediate with some selected moment of waste removal, as you said, which is basically what to do in practice, because we know that they are very similar, so we can choose the right uh, modalities according to the patient, of course. Then the second question, uh, because we, we struggle again with this, is what about uh, the initiation of um, this, uh, I would still call it, sorry, RRT, but it's more a, a substitution or partial substitution of, of renal function. How, uh, when, when you start this in the ICU, how does that change over time? Well, again, that's a, such an important question. And we've had five landmark trials in the last five years in addition to more than 30 other studies before them and a lot of uh, meta-analyses and observational studies. 
Um, so timing, appropriate timing of renal, re renal support or renal replacement therapy uh, is very important because if you start too early, then you expose patients to a, an invasive treatment, which they actually didn't need, and they are at risk of side effects. And if you start too late, then the patient may not benefit and they may have come to harm from the uh, effects of acute kidney injury. So I think everybody agrees that timing is getting the time right is important. Now the randomized controlled trials from the last five years have, had, um, have, have all been different and have had some conflicting results. So we had one trial showing a benefit benefit in the term in terms of mortality with earlier initiation and we had four trials showing no difference so they showed that early or accelerated initiation did not result in lower mortality um, the important thing first of all these are all in fantastic trials impressive trials with large numbers of patients but comparing them is very difficult because they were conducted in different patient populations. They use different criteria to, in, to determine starting. And they also used uh, different modalities or different doses. So uh, what I can say is that just in general, uh, at the moment, if you look at the general patient population, there is currently no convincing evidence that starting renal replacement therapy or renal support in patients who don't need it is beneficial. Okay, so we are moving towards, uh, you know, waiting a little bit more than in the past. That is true. But, but what we do not have at the moment is we don't have tools to determine whether the individual patient in front of us would benefit from initiation. So we, yeah. we, we're using... Urine output and creatinine both are uh, traditional but very crude markers. And they do not tell us whether uh, A, the, the kidneys are under strain, whether there is kidney reserve. And they also, more importantly, they do not tell us whether the rest of the body, the other organs, are coming to harm from acute kidney injury. So what we really need is better tools to inform the clinicians at the bedside about the impact of a kidney injury on their body and the organs and yeah. their chances of recovery. And I believe this is different for individual patients in front of us. Of course, of course, of course. That's that's absolutely, we, we agree on that. Individualized care is the way to go. Uh, and uh, do you think that, for example, the dose of renal support still matters. I remember when I started 2000, the Lomos paper on the dose of RRT. This has still, you think, and not topics uh, and how this impact on uh, renal support, maybe the studies that we are uh, now uh, reading in the literature? Absolutely. Dose does matter. The question is, what is the appropriate dose for the individual patient at the particular time? and whether the, the today's dose is still okay tomorrow. But uh, we've certainly had the landmark study by Professor Ronko 20 years ago, who, which alluded us to the fact that dose matters like anything else in critical care. Uh, subsequent studies comparing two different doses didn't show a difference. But that does not mean that dose doesn't matter. Uh, it just, in the trials which were conducted, researchers compared this uh, randomized patients to different doses and then patients received the same dose throughout their uh, the duration first of all there is a we wouldn't start renal replacement therapy if if no dose mattered because there is clearly a minimum dose that's necessary to rem to remove waste products and water and fluid we don't quite know where the minimum dose is. Arbitrarily, people believe it may be at around 20 to 25 mils per kilo. To achieve this, you have to set the target a bit higher because there may be unexpected, unplanned discontinuations. 
But whether this dose, this recommended dose in the current guideline is the right dose for every patient at any time of the critical illness is still up for debate. And you may argue that like with ventilation, people need, the, or the kidneys and the, and the patients need a bit more support at the time when they're hemodynamically very compromised and they're metabolically very, very challenged. And they could do with less when they are recovering and their kidney function is recovering and the other organs and the, the demand, the metabolic demand is going down. Of course. And in fairness, that has not been tested. People have not done varying doses. So, so back to the question, I, I strongly believe dose matters. Um, what we need to establish is with how we can define the right dose for a patient at a particular phase of their critical illness. Yes. So I have uh, another question, at least, which is maybe even more complicated because we have even less data. How and when you decide to withdraw renal support? Do you use um, spontaneous urine production? Some patients says, you know, fluid removal is complicated. Do you have a furosemide test? Do you just stop because the underlying disease is under control? You see what happens, which, which is your practice? Uh, so uh, really good question again. Um, in practice, sadly, I have to admit that discontinuation often happens by chance. And it happens because the patient has to go for a scan. So it, the, the, the uh, renal replacement therapy is stopped. And then uh, people say, oh, let's just see what happens. Another scenario is uh, uh, filter clotting. Again, this may prompt pe clinicians to decide to wait and see. So I'm afraid in real life, it happens by chance. But in those where we don't have unexpected circumstances, then we, um, it's my practice and in, in the unit, we look at the general recovery of the patient. So if, the patient if, the, if the patient is making progress, then we hope that the kidneys will also recover. We look at urine output. And uh, urine output is particularly important because observational retrospective studies showed that patients who passed more than 450 mils of urine spontaneously whilst on the filter had an 85% chance of coming off, off the filter. Now, 15% still needed to go back on, but this a urine output more than 400, 450 mils will prompt us to evaluate the situation and to consider a planned discontinuation. Occasionally, we give frusomite. Uh, in those who are passing urine. Um, but the practice is very, very variable. And sadly, uh, as you already alluded to, the creatinine results don't really help us here very much. I have a, a last question, Maris, because I, I agree with you. Everything you said is that basically we have now studies that give us you know, um, data to provide guidelines but these guidelines do not apply at the individual level. And even the same patients cannot be the same target one day compared to another in the, in the course of the disease. So my question to you, if we one day we study guidelines approach versus an individualized or a targeted or tailored approach, which would be uh, the way to create the study? Is it a biomarker? Is it a blood biomarker? Is it a urine biomarker? Is it some related to echo, to flow of the kidney? Which would be, in your idea, the, the ideal um, target in the future to create this individualized approach? So if I, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. If I had to, was tasked to do this study, I would wait a little bit longer because there are actually fantastic tools in uh, preparation and under investigation that will give us much better information of, about the state of the kidneys. And these are, uh, some are imaging techniques, some are um, online GFR measurements, uh, some are proteins that can be measured. But what we really need is the tools that tell us 
a kidney is under strain, it's not coping with the, the, the demand or the, the, the consequences of critical illness, and the risks of acute kidney injury on the rest of the body are too high. And they hopefully can tell us that the kidneys are likely to deteriorate further because they're under so much strain. These tools are available. There's currently research tools, but I believe I'm, I'm confident and con convinced they will come into clinical practice very, very soon. And if you had them, then you could random uh, design trials much better because then you can say, is it better to use this dose or that dose? Is it better to start with intermittent versus continuous? Because at the moment we're, we're sailing a little bit blindly, but you're using creatinine and urine output. Both are really good markers for of kidney function, but only in the stable phase. Exactly. Uh, and I think that's where we, at the moment, really need to collaborate with academics, researchers, and um, companies. Companies, yes. To to get these tools into clinical practice. I totally agree with you. I think this are this is a nice conclusion of this chat because we are always claiming for individualized care, and as you said, we need to be patient and using the right tools to maybe in the future create a nice. Um, Tyler th therapy, as we said. So Maris, really, I want to thank you for uh, all the things that we discussed today. Uh, I hope you to see in the uh, next chat, but more than that, I hope you to see you soon. I'm a note that we see you soon, the end of March in Brussels for the next, uh, next Easy Chem, and you will uh, uh, present uh, some of the topics we discussed today during the meeting. Thanks a lot for your participation. See you soon. Thank you, Fabio. And uh, what I've just said, honestly, is just really based on all the work people around the world have done. So uh, it's great to see the progress in critical care nephrology, but there's Absolutely. more work to do. Absolutely. Great. See you. See you, Marlies. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.